welcome to my latest YouTube video. I'm Ross Rosenberg, the author of The Human Magnet Syndrome and the creator of the Code Pensy Cure Treatment Program. Today, I could not be more excited because my friend, colleague, and probably the best psychotherapist I know is here again to talk about what does it look like to finally overcome what I call self-love deficit disorder or codependency and to achieve a permanent life change. So without further ado, let me introduce my friend, Robert. So Ross, I really am glad to be with you here again today to talk about a subject that's near and dear to our hearts. And I think what I really want to impress upon folks uh, watching today is that everything that we're talking about, you and I have done personally, it's a path we've walked to uh, heal ourselves and we're spreading this information to others. And I think it's, it's so important for folks to know that as they're doing their work, that there is this goal to reach as far as emotional freedom. Yeah. So it's when we work on our own stuff, heal ourselves, there's a process that takes place within us as far as like moving out this old wounded uh, false narrative that no longer serves us into this sort of greater landscape that's available to all of us so yeah. in in so many ways i think it's it's about getting out of our own way and really bringing in this this sort of new view of the world getting out of our way i love listening to you for those who don't know it i used to live very close to where bob lives and we kind of traveled around the same mental health community it's familiar to talk to you about this stuff so we've been talking about uh trauma that happens in childhood. And in, in my language, I reference it as the age of wounding. Mm -hmm. And there's, um, that's a particular age where this wounding is, is uh, or the trauma kind of coalesces. But in reality, there's trauma that's happening before and trauma that's happening after. So it's not just, you know, one event, sometimes it is one event, but for most of us, it's a cumulative effect over time that we've learned how to, as children, we learned how to adapt ourselves to this very unique dysfunctional environment. And we created these unique codependent tools to emotionally survive that environment. Mm -hmm. And so what happens with most of us is we just carry that into our adult life. And then we use those same tools to basically pick out our partners, you know, to, to join with. Uh, because what we're doing is we're, we're coming from a wounded perspective and we're usually finding someone else who's also wounded, emotionally wounded. And that's what I refer to in my, my second book as a synergistic wounding, because we don't realize what's happening as adults, but we're just, we're, we're saying, oh, I'm, I can be a codependent and look, you're a narcissist and I know how to interact with you. And so we just bring those tools into our adult life and play them out unconsciously. So in my first book, Healing Your, Your Lost Inner Child, I came up with the heal process, yeah. healing and embracing an authentic life. And that, that really is this multi-step process that I take folks through to help identify the inner child wounding, see how it's manifesting in their life, see how that inner child is stepping in front of them and making a lot of decisions in their adult life. And so, so the heal process really carries through the first book. The second book, Healing Your Wounded Relationship, I really focus on intentional communication right. because we've just, we've brought all these uh, wounded tools into our adult relationships and we're playing them out unconsciously. You know, people will say, I don't understand why I keep on choosing uh, people that are so screwed up to date or to marry. And it's because they're looking at them through a wounded lens. Right. So as, as long as we're wounded, we can't, we can't, we just see other wounded folks. How I look at it and proceed is I have these 11 stages, which I call my self-love recovery program or code cure for short. Every stage, which is difficult and challenging, uh, needs to be accomplished in order to get the tools, 
the experience and the therapeutic or treatment-based effect that is necessary for the next stage. When people reach stage nine, they have already been experiencing self-love abundance, which means the problem, self-love deficit disorder, has been neutralized, or what I call in my book, cured. Yeah, and, and you're right that that stage of self-love abundance is phenomenal to get to because that represents a lot of hard work for someone to really go through and understand all of this wound, wounded reactivity that they keep on playing out over and over. So they've reached that self-love abundance, but their relationships that they're in, the partner might not have been doing this work, their friends might not be doing this work, the family might not be doing this work. So here you have someone who is has this self-love abundance, has this awareness, but what do you see happening within their circles, you know, that, that span out from them? You know, my view on that is highly influenced uh, by uh, family systems theory, but basically it means that in any relationship or larger relationships, if there is change, there is discomfort. So if you're a healthy family and someone gets has a problem, it's uncomfortable. If someone's, if it's a dysfunctional family, if someone gets better, it's uncomfortable. And one term I created is called my surgeon general warning. In America, we have pack of cigarettes. If you smoke, you'll get emphysema. But what I say in the beginning of treatment and throughout the treatment, once you get to the point where you feel strong enough, smart enough, healthy enough to set boundaries, is you're going to lose 75 to 85% of the people you thought you loved or you thought loved you. And I make sure my client knows that because to me, it's an ethical proposition because I don't want them to be angry or resentful and say, well, I didn't know I was going to have this mass exodus of friends and family and loved ones. And when they get to that part of therapy where they know exactly what is needed to, to reach self-love abundance, and they actually get to it, and all those people have been shed from their life, there, it's not this absence of loved ones. It's more of a freedom of grief. So to your question, I prepare people for the advent of self-love abundance. What do you think or what is your experience with that? Yeah, well, very much like what you're saying as far as, you know, your self-love abundance uh, equals my, what I call the integration, the integration yeah. of the inner child having been healed then integrates with the adult self. And then I can just be me. My authentic self can just show up wherever I go. What I teach very strongly is about boundary setting. And so uh, that really is our, our key uh, to get out of this, these codependent patterns, these wounded patterns. Just because we have reached your level nine, my, my integration, doesn't mean that we have to lose all of these friendships. What, what we're doing with, at that point is coming into, back into these relationships and saying, okay, I understand who I am now, and I understand what my emotional needs are. And my emotional needs are to have mutually uh, respectful, reciprocal relationships, and I'm inviting you to be in that with me. And so it's not like they have to go away, but what we're doing is we're re-entering into that relationship and saying, okay, this is who I am today. Will you be able to be with me today? So it, it's, it's then up to the other person to say, okay, I'm, I'm going to stay with you. I'm going to really work at this. Or they might say, no, I want you to be a codependent and feed me and caretake me and, and do everything for me. And I don't want to do any work. So it, it starts to become pretty clear. And you and I've had this conversation is to understand the differences of your treatment 
or psychotherapy in mind is to understand that we have a different demographic. The clients that we work with aren't always the same. The people that I treat have a specific diagnosis. Although self-love deficit disorder has not yet been accepted by the American uh, Psychiatric Association or is included in our diagnostic statistic manual, I think of it that way. And I have very, a very clear idea of what exactly an SLD is, codependent. And I understand just like we are compelled to do before we diagnose someone, they have to fit in with all the diagnostic criteria. So the people that I work with, we make sure that they are self-love deficient or codependent, which mm -hmm. I have in my human magnet syndrome, a whole theory mm -hmm. that only the most severe people on this continuum of mine are considered codependent. So I am working with people who are SLDs, which means, at least according to my understanding and theory, is they are in a relationship with a pathological narcissist who has a personality disorder. Mm -hmm. And therein lies the difference because when people start working with me and they're in a relationship, you know, they're an SLD, they have a partner who's got a personality disorder. Which mm -hmm. means they are unable to accept responsibility. They blame everyone for their own faults and they're resistant to psychotherapy. They won't go to psychotherapy and they are incredibly susceptible to narcissistic injuries. The typical outcome of someone who enters my program um, is that if they are in a relationship, the probability is quite high that that relationship will fail. Mm -hmm. not, not that I have an agenda to cause a breakup, cause a divorce, but it is logical um, that as one gets better and the other can't, and the yep. other, the one that can't is going to try to sabotage, then they're eventually going to break free from that person. So your work includes a wider spectrum of folks. It's a much broader uh, focus, I guess, because, yes. you know, in my book, um, Healing Your Wounded Relationship, what I do is I take the reader through all these different types of synergistically wounded connections. And so it's not just the narcissist, but it's someone who uh, is, is going through addictions and, right. and how they're reacting and responding to that. Or it's someone who's um, a, a liar, who's, who's a falsifier, who's a betrayer, and how they're interacting with that, or someone who's controlling. Uh, so there's, there's all these different dynamics that I like to point out, but what's happening within each is that as a person progresses, I believe that they get to what I call their personal threshold of where they're not gonna take that anymore, right. where they've healed enough to know more and say, my life can be better today. And that's really what I want the viewers to recognize is that if you're recognizing what these aspects of what Ross and I are talking about, to know that your life can become better that you can learn these skills of moving out of these wounded reactive patterns, that right. you can set strong boundaries, that you can really help yourself heal and move away from these um, situations that are just reinforcing maybe a false narrative that you've carried about yourself. And so there, there's so many possibilities, so many potentials um, for everyone to do this work Ross and I have different approaches, but we're, we're basically in the same neighborhood. You know, we, we talk about it and, and reference things differently, but it's the same idea that's coming up. And right. we're, we're bringing our approaches, you know, as far as this is how you can work with it. Oh, absolutely. And what I, I appreciate about your work is although that degree of pathology or the type of person and their uh, problems might differ, you also are not shy about if someone is in a relationship with a harmful or abusive person, say uh, a pathological right. narcissist, that um, through their progress uh, with you, um, they get to the point where they make the healthy decision, or, or, or as I would say, the healthy decision makes itself. And if mm -hmm. someone is capable um, of growing with that person and doing their own work, which is... Yeah. 
which you experience much more than what I do, everything changes for the best. The people that have the capacity to grow with that person, even if they're the recipient of a boundary, they stick around. And once someone gets to that point of my stage nine of achieving self love abundance, they no longer have that pathological loneliness. They love living by themselves or being in a relationship where they can be by themselves without any feelings of being trapped or loneliness. And it's absolutely a wonder for me as a psychotherapist, seeing your client metaphorically walk for the first time and see that, you know, when my son Ben walked, he looked so happy and proud of himself. <laughs> and, and to me, when my clients get to that point, I don't know if there's a, a better moment in my, in my profession when I get to those. You're, you're right. It truly is a beautiful uh, thing to witness uh, someone else's healing path. And when they come to this a recognition within themselves that they can have a, a bigger life, a much fuller life, a life filled with, with greater freedom is waiting for them. But I think the biggest thing that it gives folks is that they now see that they have options, that they're no longer limited right. by someone else's definition of how they should live their life or how they should think about themselves, that they have a sense of agency within themselves of saying, this is who I am today. This is what my needs are. This is what I can claim. And, and I reference that um, in my relationship book with intentional communication. Right. So how you're, how you're coming into your relationships, how you're speaking your truth, how you're owning that. And that's what comes about with your level nine. That's what comes about with yeah. my stage of integration, where we're able to just be authentically who we are, who we're, we're showing up as. You know, I, I, I tell people that, you know, who you're seeing within me is, is how I am with anyone. So it's not like I'm, I'm curating a version of me for you. It's like, I'm just being myself. But, but that has come about from so much hard work that I've done and I know that you've done. So that personal growth is, is really what, you know, allows us to enter into this stage of, of freedom. Yeah, and I can only imagine the folks that you work with, their partners, considering they're not, you know, personality disorder, they are working with them. And, and you, you get to experience not only the, the client, the individual, but you experience the partner. Does your treatment include couples and marital work? Yeah, the, the relationship book was designed for a couple to sit down and work through the book and the exercises together because like my first book, this the relationship book is all about a practical approach right. for couples. But, but I, I'm realistic with the reader when I say that you may be reading this book on your own. Right. You know, your partner may not be ready for this work, may not be interested in this work, but even someone going through and reading the relationship book on their own is going to gather a lot of information as far as this is what I need in my relationship and, and how am I showing up in my relationship? How's my partner showing up? And how can I communicate what I really need? And so that it really brings in a lot of healing work that the person probably has already done. Right. And, and begins to apply it. I require, and by the way, 60% of my clients actually listen to me. <laughs> I require abstinence from any romantic relationship. Because that will throw the client off track. I'd require a cease in all romance. So by the time they get to stage nine, their life is not in any way impacted by another relationship. Through this process, they have built the most important relationship that they will ever need in their life is with them. Mm -hmm. And then at the completion of stage nine, the stage 10 is bringing self-love abundance into a self 
love abundant mutual relationship with self love abundance. And in my stage 10, the human magnet syndrome works and brings healthy people together who don't need the relationship to be happy. Someone who is independent, um, autonomous, self-loving will find another person who is not based upon this need, but the shared enjoyment of being themselves and the love that comes together in a relationship. Right, because a healed heart can more easily see and find another healed heart. Uh, but a healed heart can also recognize someone who's wounded. Because when we, are, when we are more healed, we have a greater perspective of the landscape and we can recognize red flags much sooner, which I talk about in the book as far as how to recognize red flags and why when we're in a wounded place, it's really hard to recognize and see those red flags because we think that that's normal. But a healed heart can, can have a much broader uh, view of the entire landscape and have a much more educated sense of who's, who's good for me and who's not good for me, who's going to help me reach my goals, who's going to make me want to be smaller so I can fit into their world. And, and that consciousness is incredibly important to move towards a level of permanent self-love abundance yeah. and eventual self-love abundant mutual relationship. Through my Human Magnet Center book, I explain that relationships come together unconsciously because a match, it's a matching of the relationship template. Codependents and narcissists create the perfect dance team. Their exciting, dysfunctional tango works because the leader, the narcissist, leads with charm, seduction, power, and control, while the follower, the codependent, reacts with their pliable, passive, and accommodating dance moves. And that is why there's a big emphasis in my program on the dissociative work, the work that you can't get to just through plain talk. And that is accessing the, the inner trauma child and overcoming, neutralizing um, the attachment trauma so that it does not direct the human magnet syndrome compulsion to be with the only type of person they've ever known how to love, the narcissist. So long story short, by the time they get to stage nine, and I formally, it really is not like, okay, you can now date. You know, I don't have that much power and control, but... Um, I formally uh, suggest um, it's time to date. That unconscious chemistry-based relationship um, attraction phenomenon, yeah. it works with healthy people. Uh, healthy yeah. people are drawn to each other. That's and, right. And if they should come um, across someone who's not as healthy as them, it's a repulsion. So the human magnet syndrome works almost exactly the same, except that magnetic attraction dynamic fundamentally changes. It, and it changes because one of those uh, people have healed enough Yes, that, that they're no longer energized by that, what I call the synergistic wounding. Yes. So yes. It, the synergistic wounding isn't working anymore because they've healed enough. They've reached a personal threshold. They've said, uh, this doesn't work for me. This is what I need in my life. And that's when relationships can really get real. And that's when couples can begin to have some honest communication. And hopefully they can do that before they, they act out in ways of having affairs or going into addictions, that sort of thing, where they can be honest with themselves and their partners and say, look, this is where I'm at today. This is what I need. And, and they can get to that point by doing all this personal work. Right. So I, I want to go back to something just to clarify for the viewer. So earlier today, uh, I was talking about codependency, the tools or the skills that we learned in childhood. And I referenced them as tools or skills because as a little boy, I, I was doing my best to survive this dysfunctional family environment. Uh, and so I referenced them as tools or skills in a positive psychology context.
because the last thing that a codependent needs is more shame. So the last thing I need is to feel more ashamed of what I was doing, what came very naturally to me as a little kid. So it's like, I was trying my best. These are the tools that I, I developed and I brought them into my adult life. And the second thing that I always like to say is that I'm a codependent in recovery, meaning that every day I'm working on boundary setting. I'm working on being honest with myself and, and others in my life. So I'm always working to not slide back into those patterns that were just so strongly developed in childhood. So I, I don't know if you have any reference point oh, yeah. for that. The focus on skill acquisition, the focus on practical, pragmatic exercises and work, they, they will never ever work if the foundation is what I call self-love deficient. Because that pull is directed by the inner trauma child, that person's repressed, disassociated memories, much like someone with PTSD. It's fast, yeah. they can't remember it, of being this broken child who only knows how to take care of a narcissist. But once that is resolved, and of course, in, in my stage program, you know, there's different stages that address that. Yeah. And the, the skill acquisition, the practice, learning through mistakes, it takes hold. And that larger unconscious compulsion to be with a narcissist, it goes away. Our clients are, and, and again, I use this analogy of a child. Um, it's like they are practicing a self-love based life for the first time. And I guess we could not expect our clients to overcome their severe psychological, emotional problems if we didn't teach them what to do and how to do it. And that's why I, I was so fascinated and, and appreciative of your book because you kind of lay it out there. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, it, it has to be practical. Lots, there's lots of books out there that identify the problem, but uh, it's hard to find a book that identifies the problem, but also gives you a practical approach. And that's, that's really the, the, the basis of both of our work, uh, you know, what we're trying to bring across to folks. So I think that the, the more, you know, knowledge is power. So the more folks uh, know as far as what they can do, how they can approach these very complex relationship dynamics and know that they can come out the other side more whole, more complete, more authentic, that, that it does take time, it takes work, but what a, a gift it is to have that emotional freedom, that sense of inside that, that I'm my own person and that I can create my destiny. Yeah, and, and, and when our clients get that way, again, going back to what I said earlier, they have this fundamental shift in so many observable areas of their life, uh, mm -hmm. whether it's just a smile, the way they walk, the way they approach relationships and work, and what happens eventually, and, and this goes through what most, and being a little bit judgmental here, most good therapists practice is that psychotherapy should terminate when the client has the skills and the ability to solve their own problem. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, that is probably the most joyous um, and exciting time of my, of, of my work with my clients. Although I do get sad when I, um, I don't, I don't really let them know that, but when they go, because I, you know, I, I really, I really care for my clients, but they no longer need us because they don't have, for lack of better words, the skeletons in their closets, the ghosts of their past, that trauma that keeps sabotaging them. And they have this foundation of self-love abundance and they know exactly what to do. And should they need help, there's no shame in reaching out. And yeah. And, and when they get to that point, it's usually a pretty exciting time when we kind of wrap things up in the treatment. What, what, what I, is your own experience with, with that? I, I think you said that beautifully. And I agree with you that uh, when someone is in therapy and they have uh, learned these new skills and they're applying them and things are, are starting to fall in place for them and they're feeling better about their life, 
that that usually is the time for them to move on from therapy for a while. It doesn't mean that they can't come back into therapy, but it means that they've they've gotten what they've needed at that point. And I just received a, a note from a gal that I saw maybe about five years or so, and I referenced her story in my first book, um, and she just thanked me for all the work we did together and and for the life she has today and how far she came in her work and her personal journey. And, you know, she was thanking me for helping her, which I appreciated. But what I told her was that it was such a joy for me to witness right. her work, that that's job satisfaction for me. I mean, that's what a gift that is for us to be invited into someone else's life and to help them in, in some way that we can. Exactly. Although it's not a parent-child relationship, but there's some element for me that runs parallel. Like, you know, when Ben, my son, was old enough to be on his own and he, you know, I trusted that he had everything that he needed to navigate those difficult uh, moments by himself and if not, reach out to me or other trusted ones. That is an, an exciting moment for a parent that knows how yeah. to let go and trust that the way that they parented their child has imbued him or her with their own abilities to love, respect, and care for themselves and make good choices. And should they not, learn from them. And that, to me, is, is the wonderful, in, in some ways, enlightening end to the treatment. It, it might be the end of the treatment process, but it's not the end for that person you know, right? Because like what I was saying, I'm a codependent in recovery. I work on my stuff every day. So it, it really requires for each of us to be very consciously aware of what we're doing in our life, the, the choices we're making, the boundaries that we're setting. So yeah, we, we have the skill set now, but now we need to continually use that and to move forward and to keep on expanding. So I, I think that what we're talking about is such a beautiful kind of wrap up to everything yes. we've we've talked about today, which is bring you know kind of comes full circle in a way. Yes, beautifully done. And and um, like I said, I just love having discussions with you. And I think the viewers of, of my YouTube channel will equally love or appreciate this conversation, as I'm quite confident yours will too. Tell us about um, your books and uh, what you do and how people can get a hold of you. So uh, folks can reach me through my website portal, which is the art of practical wisdom uh, so you can you can find me there as well as uh, more information about my books. And I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. And I, I hope we uh, you know, have touched upon some some issues that your the viewers can really connect to, and of course they can people can write to me for more clarification if if you want through my website. Mm -hmm. But uh, this has been great today. If you like this video, please comment. Comments are so important because there's a community I call my self love recovery community out there that needs to know they're not alone. Well, Bob, I look forward to the next time we meet and have a lot of fun talking about what we are most passionate about. Me too. Me too. This was great. Thank you. Oh, you take care now. Bye-bye.